Hello, and thank you for joining us, Ford. I hope it will be an interesting and informative discussion around some of the latest data in rheumatology. My name is Professor Peter Nash from Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane. And today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Professor Maria Antonietta D'Agostino, who is head of the rheumatology department at the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Rome. And she's at a meeting, so she's walked out to give us a little bit of time. We greatly appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure for you to join us today, Maria. Uh, we're discussing one of your recent papers, which is the effect of secukinumab on synovitis and enthesitis in patients with psoriatic arthritis. This is the 52-week clinical and ultrasound results from the ultimate trial, um, which is a randomised double-blind trial with an open-label extension. So welcome. How are you? How's everything in Rome and in Europe at the moment? Is it cold because it's 35 degrees here? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Here in Rome, it's quite warm. It's not the same in the rest of Europe, but I am lucky. Probably I have the same weather as you have uh, in Australia. <laughs> or probably a little colder. <laughs> but, uh, Excellent. So, so tell us a little bit about the, about the objective, why you wanted to do this study. What was the aim and, and goal of doing this study? So uh, thank you for asking this question. You know, we know that uh, psoriatic arthritis uh, is a quite uh, uh, complex disease in which uh, we can evaluate the disease activity by synovitis, uh, but uh, uh, evaluating the swollen joint or the enthesitis. But sometimes an objective measure of the disease can tell us much more about the response. So the objective of this trial was for the first time to demonstrate that ultra ultrasound detected synovitis, so the measure of inflammation detected by using ultrasound is able to show a response to a treatment, in that case it was a secukinumab in active patients, as compared to placebo. In, indeed, this study was including a placebo arm for the first three months, and we were evaluating the capability of ultrasound to show a response and a difference against placebo. So this study okay. was a three-period arm, a three-period, I would say, part of the study. The first with placebo control. The second one from week 12 to week 24, it was an open label evaluation in which we also evaluated the capability of ultrasound to measure the response in patient under placebo that there was switched to secukinumab. And then the third part, it was a six months open label in which we were evaluating the long-term response. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about the, the uh, outcome measures. For example, could you explain the, the GLOWS score uh, and some yeah. of the OMARAC scores? Because synovitis we get, but it's quite difficult with enthesitis. Sometimes you see something, but it's not tender. Sometimes it's tender, you don't see something. Synovitis is okay, but just reassure us that enthesitis is well measured by by ultrasound and what these just the scores you used as your outcome measures. Perfect. So for measuring synovitis, because we know that ultrasound is good to see synovitis, but uh, there are several publications using several scoring systems. Within the OMERACT, during the last 10 years, we have developed a scoring system for measuring synovitis that is merging the B mode, so the morphology of synovitis, with the Doppler activity, the measure of the vascularization. This uh, mix, I would say, this combined evaluation allows allow us to be um, very good, even if we have different machines with different sensitivity to the Doppler. And this score was validated in rheumatoid arthritis, and we wanted to demonstrate that also in other diseases that, that involve synovitis, it is a good scoring system. On the other hand, we know that enthesitis is a marker and a landmark of psoriatic arthritis. And we have developed uh, uh, within the OMERA group an enthesitis scoring. And we wanted also to see if the evaluation of enthesitis by ultrasound was able to show the response and the difference with, between a placebo and an active drug. And so we derived a 
composite scoring merging B mode enthesitis and Doppler enthesitis to see if this score was also sensitive to change. And so we demonstrated that uh, the ultrasound, the OMERAT ultrasound scoring system, although ultrasound enthesitis was not an active inclusion criteria of the study because we didn't want to complicate too much. We ask that patients had an active ultrasound detected synovitis, but only a clinically detected enthesitis. But we performed the ultrasound enthesitis in all patients. And we were able to demonstrate that although we do not select patients with an ultrasound enthesitis, if we detect an ultrasound, uh, an enthesitis by ultrasound, this is sensitive to change. And we demonstrated also that uh, the preliminary OMERAC scoring system for uh, enthesitis is sensitive to change and able to discriminate between placebo and active drug. Excellent. So you had 166 patients. These were followed for a year. This is the long-term extension part of the study. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, your results um, to help the clinician understand how to use ultrasound in their day-to-day -day practice. So I think that uh, what it is important is that uh, we did study for, for the first time, we demonstrate in a multi-center, multi-global study using different machines and uh, different ultrasonographers that ultrasound is a really objective tool to show the response to treatment. So if we want to show that secukinumab, it is an active drug and it is able to differentiate between placebo and patient treated, we were able to demonstrate so. At the same time, we were also able to demonstrate that if there is an active enthesitis and you are not sure with the clinical evaluation if it is responding or not, by using ultrasound, you can see the decrease of the inflammation measured by Doppler or by DB mode using this tool. So what we can learn, there are two major learning uh, points. One, that uh, ultrasound is an objective tool to be used in clinical trials across different center with different machine because by using a validating scoring system, we can have a very good measure for clinical trials. And at the same time, we are able to select in clinical practice patients that really need a treatment because they are active and using an objective measure to detect the activity, we can also follow this patient over time to select, uh, to see the response. This is very good, especially in patients that they are difficult to evaluate by clinical evaluation. For example, patients that they have concomitant osteoarthritis, that they have, uh, for example, they have uh, joints, that they, are, uh, they have some deformation or some structural changes. By using ultrasound, we can really measure objectively the information and make the difference between chronic changes and active inflammatory changes. That's very helpful because we often get asked by our dermatologists to see patients with primary nodal osteoarthritis who have psoriasis, and the question is always, do they have PSA on top of that? And we do use imaging like ultrasound to try and help us decide in that situation. In your paper, you've got a lovely diagram of the baseline distribution of the enthesitis. Do you find generally that PSA patients have a lot of enthesitis and are sore in areas they don't even know are inflamed? So that when we have patients at the enthesitis end, which we call fibromyalgia because we don't find any joint swelling, when in fact they actually have a lot of enthesitis, is that a common finding or not? It is quite a common finding. First, I would like to say that uh, in our study, the mean number of NTs involved by ultrasound was four in all patients, but it was also four by clinical evaluation. So mostly the, the NTs that they were involved in uh, by ultrasound were also involved by enthesitis. But what it is the great aspect of enthesitis is that it is able to show if there is an inflammation where the site is painful. 
when with the clinical evaluation, we cannot make the difference between a fibromyalgia point and an enthesitis, a clinical enthesitis, if it is not one of the most common enthesis involved, like elbow of Achilles tendon. But with the ultrasound showing the abnormalities by ultrasound, we can really make the differential diagnosis. And I'll, the, the diagram looks very helpful. Are there any particular spots that are better to follow or to examine than any others? Do you know what I mean? Are there sort of key spots that you can follow simply exactly. and easily, or do you have to do all of them? Of course, if you want to make a global evaluation, you should try to examine all the enthesis. But looking at the spots and the, the frequency of the enthesis involvement, I would like to say that if you're in your clinical practice, you examine the lateral epicondyle, the insertion of the quadriceps, the two insertion of the patellar. So you focus on the elbow, the knee, and the Achilles tendon, you can have a global evaluation of the enthesitis burden in your patient. So that's a bit like the Leeds Enthesitis Index, just boils down to these few areas. Which is exactly. Unless that the enthesitis index is looking at the lateral painful aspect of the knee when we are really looking at the insertional enthesis of the knee. Okay. And you compared change in baseline to the SPARC index. Um, mm -hmm. and what measures did you find most helpful in this study? One the clinical block. measure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say that uh, probably in psoriatic arthritis, using the Spark is the best scoring system clinically used to detect the activity of the disease at enthesial point because the LEI, uh, the masses, uh, they are a little limited. With the Spark enthesitis score, you can have a global evaluation of all the accessible enthesis. And uh, I think that uh, this is, for me, the most useful clinical tool. Okay, so the Spark has a, a number of other um, spots to measure, mainly around the spine, pelvis, et cetera, et cetera. So tell us, let's turn to look at Sekikinumab itself. Was there a dose difference, 150 versus 300? Can you give us any idea about the effect of the medication on your imaging? So I, in our study, they were all biological naive. So they were not responding to the current medication, either conventional DMARTs or NSAIDs. So our um, secukinumab doses was just made at the time that we planned the study on the skin involvement. So some of the patients received 300, some of the patients received uh, 150. So we could not see a difference in between the two doses because we pulled all the data. There was not a plan to, be, uh, to see the difference. But I would say that in actual practice, using the 300 probably is the best doses for covering either synovitis and enthesitis in the same patient. Yes, we find that clinically. And that, that's, and we're lucky we have flat pricing. We can use 300 routinely. Exactly. And, and would you say that the efficacy on the synovitis or the efficacy on the emphasitis, where there was any difference? Because one of the um, georg shett hypotheses that emphasitis comes first and then skin first, emphasitis, synovitis, do you, are you able to comment on whether that's your, this study backs up that hypothesis? And whether uh, so is good for enthesitis in particular or good for synovitis in particular? So what we we showed that uh, the difference between placebo and active drug was seen by the first week in both the, the measure, in both the endpoint, synovitis and also enthesitis. So if uh, we, we have to say which was faster, I would say that both they are faster measuring the inflammation. So if the inflammation decreases, decrease a synovial level, but also a dentesitis level, which is coming first. I think that this question is very important at the beginning of the disease, which is the first manifestation. But once the disease is there, our objective should be to shut down the inflammation. And 
the placebo patients picked up very quickly when you switched them to active drug? Um, it was completely rapid, as with the same increased, or would say the um, movement of rapidity that we have observed when you start at the beginning. So I think that this is showing really the efficacy of an active drug, especially and, in that case, tenokinogan. And one of the criticisms of many therapies that we don't see with this one is loss of effect over time. Did you see any re recurrence of synovitis enthesitis heading out towards 12 months in the people on active drug? So if I have to be completely clear, and that this can be seen by the study, since enthesitis was not uh, an inclusion criteria, the ultrasound detected enthesitis, we have seen a response, so a decrease of the inflammatory sign, but we didn't reach the, this exploratory endpoint at 12 weeks because some of the patients relapse on the enthesitis. We saw the difference over, uh, I would say, eight uh, weeks, but at the 12 weeks, this difference was not present, probably because some of the patients re-increased in the enthesitis marker. But this could be also due to the fact that we didn't reach the sample size able to show that. So I would say, that it is true, probably some patients may relapse, but what it is the important information that an objective tool like ultrasound is able to show you if there is a true relapse. So a relapse that is really touching a joint or an enthesis. Exactly how we think about ultrasound in our clinic, when we're thinking about trying to taper patients, if they have subclinical synovitis, seen an ultrasound, the taper is not going to be successful. So Absolutely. can you com comment on the use of ultrasound when you have someone in a good state and want to taper therapy? So all the studies, uh, the monocentric, uh, B-centric study using ultrasound to evaluate the remission in psoriatic arthritis patient and showing that there is a residual inflammation by imaging, so by ultrasound and not by clinical, these patients are the first to relapse. So I would say that nowadays there is no matter to say that what we are measuring by ultrasound is a true inflammation. So wherever you see or in which way you see the inflammation by clinical by ultrasound, if there is some sign of active enthesitis despite the decrease of a patient reported outcome, I would say that you have never to stop or taper the treatment because this will be a patient who will relapse soon. Okay, so take home message. For the clinician, should we have ultrasound in every clinic and everyone should learn how to do it or reserve I would it? Say that, yeah, I would say that uh, you have to at least to have an ultrasonographer making this, that it would be good to have uh, an ultrasound evaluation at baseline when you start a treatment. Probably not to use uh, ultrasound in, in daily practice for following a patient under treatment, but to use at the moment in which you have a doubt. There is a discordance between you and the patient or when you want to taper or change a therapy. So there, there really um, triggers moment of the patient in which you do not know where you are going. And our, and our ultrasonographer, what measures should we ask her to do for us at baseline in these patients? I think that uh, in patients with psoriatic arthritis, what we have demonstrated that you have to evaluate using a validated scoring system like the eula romerat scoring system for synovitis and the scoring system for enthesitis developed by the Omerat group, you have to evaluate at at least uh, the enthesis of the elbow, the knee, and the Achilles tendon, and at least uh, the uh, synovial uh, sites of the hands, the feet, and the elbow. Okay, so that's that would be the minimum requirement. Um, and then you can, in patients where you've got doubt, you've got a baseline, and you can, you can look at those sites later on and compare them and contrast them. So thanks very much. Anything else you want to tell the clinicians about the study. What are you planning to do next? Is there a follow-up? Is there other studies that you think this study led you to? So what I would like to say that the ultrasound is a really objective and valid tool in our 
trials and in our practice also to decide the amount of inflammation of the patients. What we have done as exploratory analysis of this study that will be published soon is to evaluate the cluster analysis as compared to the response to the treatment. What we have seen that according to the amount of inflammatory findings by the ultrasound baseline, we can characterize the group of ultimate patients with patients with a very active disease and the patient with a, a less active disease. And in that case, what we have seen that the patient with active disease responds better. So what it means that ultrasound is a really clear tool to select patients either for a drug, active drug, either for clinical trials. So ultrasound should be your friend, either in clinical practice that for trials. So you've done treat to target using ultrasound and rheumatoid. And from what I can recall, it wasn't particularly helpful. Are you going to do treat to target in PSA like that rheumatoid study? I guess so, because uh, uh, PSA is a different disease. I don't want to go back to some methodological uh, points of the previous studies, uh, especially what it was used as an endpoint. But in any case, I think that if we start to design now a treat-to-target study on rheumatoid arthritis with different aspects, with different scoring system, we will be able also to see the advantage of this, uh, of this tool. Okay, well, best of luck, and I hope you do that study in PSA with the better outcome measures, and you might show a very important difference. So thanks I again for your time, Maria. If you'd like you to know much. more about, if you'd like to know more about this paper and others uploaded to the IMID website, you can get detailed slide sets. You can get the publication, the publication section, and slides that uh, you can read the paper for yourself. Please subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or other podcast media and let us know what you think. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Keep up with all the new IMID content coming soon in 2024. So thank you so much, Maria. Thank you for sparing bye your bye. time. We hope people have found this helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.